of our members of seminars this term. So welcome back again to, to, to students this term and hello to everybody, including those who might, might have come over from the School of Global Studies as well as here. And I'm really delighted to welcome for this first seminar Dr. Tobias Haller, um, who is based at the Institute of Anthrop Social Anthropology at the University of Bern and is also a member of CDE, the Centre for Development and Environment, which is linked to the University of Bern. And it's quite a similar organisation to, to IDS in some ways, similar size, similar kind of interdisciplinary work around development studies and in this case also the relationship with, with environment. Um, so a similar kind of set of interests in both the academic but as applied to, to real world challenges. And I, I mean, I've known Tobias's work for some time, but we actually met again at some events in Switzerland I was at just before Christmas, where um, he told me about a really fascinating uh, kind of almost experiment and exercise that he'd been convening with, with the students that he's involved with. And I said that would be of enormous interest to us here, partly because it's also about the sustainable development goals. And as you're all aware, we've picked out the SDGs as the theme for our Sussex development lectures during this year. So we've got a lot of big lectures coming up on the SDGs. But this was a topic really that fits with that theme that I felt warranted a little bit of slightly more informal sharing and discussion about the rather interesting thing that Tobias and his students have done. So without further ado, <laughs> let me hand over and tell us about what you and your students have been doing and then we'll have a discussion. Right. Exactly. Thank you very much. I have a... Do you know you've got yeah, a uh, Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks very much to, to uh, Melissa and also to James for, for, uh, for, her, for having me here. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk in front of you about this experiment um, regarding uh, the SDGs. And um, we had a, a seminar... Um, at the Institute of Social Anthropology in the fall 16, um, 17 semester um, regarding this topic, paradigm change or old wine in new bottles, debating and reformulating SDGs. Um, the idea actually uh, was, and you see, <laughs> you see it on the, on the caricature, on, on the picture, I mean, do the SDGs really match with um, issues that are dealt um, with, oops, sorry. Um, perhaps you can help me it's sort of switching yeah mm. yeah issues um, uh, that social anthropology or new social anthropology literature and development study literature is discussing with um, it's an experiment which we made actually reading new literature new literature at that time there's a lot more literature coming up um, and actually seeing how this fits um, the, the SDGs. So discussing the SDGs based on new literature and social anthropology on SDG related issues and the question was do SDGs, the way they're formulated, really represent this new thinking in um, actually human environment relations or is it still a top-down aspect um, which is covered up in uh, development concepts in new green uh, fancy dresses so to speak. So, um, adopting an approach which we are discussing, combining new institutionalism perspectives in social anthropology, looking at the importance of rules and regulations and how they are shaped, and combine this with issue of power of politics from political ecology. From that perspective, we ask ourselves, when we have that basis, should the SDGs be reformulated? And if yes, how should this be done? If you go to our website, you will um, find the, the report, which I um, also send around. Um, through, out of that seminar, we actually had a written report where you can read most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. And um, I must apologize also, this presentation will be very wordy, because as we read the SDGs and try to reformulate it, I'm really sorry that I have to guide you through some, some texts, but I hope we do this um, so that you can, can follow. Um, as uh, Lisa Rich also said, I'm related to the Center for Development and Environment at, at the University of Bern, and this center is very important in the international debate on the SDGs. So CDE representatives such as uh, Peter Messerly are very close to the um, uh, general director of um, of the UN on UN level actually discussing on the um, on the SDGs. 
When we were discussing in the seminar, we were having a look at three elements which we wanted to have a look at before we actually started. And these are three preambles uh, which we took from uh, several uh, debates that we were engaged in. Uh, first of all, we wanted to have a look at development discourses and um, um, that most of them also to be considered as tools for powerful actors shaping the definition of what is in sustainability, what is development, as well as what are rules and regulations, rules of the game of how to do development. And we also um, were discussing James Ferguson's work of the anti-politics uh, machine. So are the SDGs just a new form of anti-politics machine, of development, which actually hides the power constellations which are behind. So we talk about sustainability, people should have sustainable agriculture, but they don't have access to land. So how can this, that, be, uh, that be matched? And in addition, there's this issue uh, by a very interesting work by Morten German on poor numbers. We all rely heavily um, on, um, on GDPs, but GDPs for Africa, um, gross domestic product data for Africa are so confusing, they're not clear. Several um, actually um, databases are not clear where, for instance, Zambia is positioned and where other countries are, are positioned. So there's a, there's a lot of confusing uh, things about it. Um, the second one was the issue of distribution. So this, uh, of course, the work of David Harry, but also of a French economist called um, Piketty, who actually shows that um, there's a huge concentration of wealth in very few hands. I mean, Oxfam picked this up as well. We'll come uh, later on to this. But that will pose also a high threat, actually, to economic development um, worldwide. And um, that linked then to uh, another issue, uh, which comes again from James Ferguson from a new book from his, is the idea, how should this wealth be uh, distributed? So is it just something that the rich give to the poor as a gift? And Ferguson says, no, Ferguson says, this is a rightful share. Everybody has actually um, had um, to work for all that wealth, which is concentrated in few hands, and it should be sort of distributed. So that's uh, preamble two. And preamble three is, out of this, are there actually um, new innovations how to do um, sustainable development, how to do a different way of development. And we had a look at potentials and pitfalls of this, reflecting on the VVBN or Bien Vivir approach uh, in Latin America, but as well on the Echo Village movement. I don't know if you're familiar with this approach of the Echo Village movement, really trying to set up villages uh, which are sort of uh, self <laughs> contained, where actually people are coming from outside but try to lead a different, more sustainable way of agricultural life. So uh, these aspects we were discussing also critically because first VVBN is heavily based on mining and extractivism, you know, that's the way then the money comes and should be distributed. So indigenous peoples in Bolivia, they face the same problems in certain areas, although you have an indigenous president as, uh, as uh, elsewhere. And eco-villages, this is often very close, you know, they don't deal very much with their environment. They have a network, but um, actually they're not uh, looked at very well. So are these really new um, ideas and new innovations and what we come up is at um, other um, options, new diverse options for in democratic settings for bottom-up institution building processes, for processes that from the bottom up, new rules and regulations for sustainable use of the environment can be created. We call this then uh, constitutionality. I will talk about this later on. And we have several publications in um, um, a volume of human ecology in 2018 where we study cases where this sort of um, uh, happened. Um, so to take you further, we had actually six topical issues where we tried to regroup the SDGs according to the literature which we were leading. First, we had the question of the commons debate related to SDG 6, uh, 14 and 15, this live on water and, and land, etc. So we had a look at this one. Then the second, there's a lot of literature on land grab debate that relates to SDGs 7, 8 and 9 regarding investment, energy, etc. Then, of course, the climate change debate where we didn't just see uh, SDG 13, which deals with climate change, but also other SDGs related to lifestyle in urban context, etc. Then we had the distributional um, uh, choice debate, meaning all the SDGs around hunger, poverty, etc. Um, what does new literature actually say to this and how should the SDGs then be reformulated? And the last two, the first one is dealing with the institutional politic of distribution the debate that links to that Ferguson 
um, discussion regarding the rightful share to uh, new resources. And then, uh, last but not least, local initiatives and participation debate. That's the SDG number 17, which deals with participation. So, the first set. And I know I will uh, really sort of throw this at you. It's a lot of text because I will show one, two examples for each um, of these topics which we were discussing, where you see the initial formulation and how the students reformulated them. <coughs> And regarding the literature, I must say that uh, on the one hand side, um, we used uh, literature which was around, but of course, I also um, gave the students to read some of the literature which I produced myself from my research in northern Cameroon when I started my PhD. And then uh, later on, I did a lot of research in African floodplain areas, my, me personally, specifically in Zambia. And this is a picture from Zambia. Um, this is uh, uh, modern types of, of fisheries, which is very destructive, where actually this common pool resource is completely um, overused there. And it's very difficult for local people to do something against it because they don't don't have the power to say one should not fish um, uh, like this. So the issue uh, was actually sustainable management of resources on land and water as well as common pool resources held in common property was and is a possibility by local institutions. That's something which we get from Eleanor Ostrom's work. So local people are actually able to organize themselves to manage resources sustainably. But um, one needs to include a power analysis, and I did that in several publications. I uh, have here one which I'm, which I'm citing. Um, and actually, um, one needs to know who has the power to devise these rules. Is this a more shared power in local community or does someone has the power to say how these resources shall be used? And secondly, uh, a very important thing, and there really I got a lot of input from um, Melissa and James uh, regarding uh, the book Misreading in an African Landscape. I think it's important to see that all the landscape we're in, even landscapes which are very dry, even um, uh, rainforest, etc., that these are all cultural landscape ecosystems. They have been created by local people. They are not the same if local people don't use it. We see this in Switzerland, you know, as actually a lot of farmers are not engaged in maintaining some alpine pastures because they don't get enough money for milk, etc. These environments change completely, and not for the good, for biodiversity. So uh, a lot of animals who depended on this changed landscape won't find fodder, etc. So this is a very complex thing. I don't want to go further into this, but I think this is a very crucial thing. And also, as the Swiss government has realized, we need to pay the farmers for their services. Why don't we pay? Or why um, is the whole, in the whole development discussion, uh, sustainable development discussion, why is it not the idea that we also pay Africans for the maintaining of a floodplain, of a, of a mountain area with terraces where I did my, my field work for my PhD, etc.? All these things are cultural landscape, and that's also then related to property rights. I mean, they maintain it, they, they own it. In Switzerland, it's clear that the government cannot come and say, I take away that pastoral area from you. In most other places um, in the world, this is possible. And that is a really strange thing. So that is one point which is important. Then the second point, colonial and neoliberal expansion actually brought changes, brought changes in so-called relative prices. That comes from this new institutionalism saying, if the external factors are changing the value of a context and the resource, if, for instance, suddenly fish in the picture which we saw gets more uh, valuable. So a lot of people from outside, from towns, etc., move in and try to use this fish. So local people lose the access then to fish. And that happened in, in many times, and that is also related to power constellation. Who has the power actually to say, I have a right to get access to this fish? And that is linked to that institutional change. And I think this is a very crucial thing which is not looked at. The institutional change that most of resource management in all these areas we are related to the SDGs have been in one form or another linked or strongly linked to common property regimes. If you look again, I come from Switzerland, I use this example, 80% of ownership rights of Alpine areas in Switzerland are common property systems. You know, they are this private property as well, but common property is so important. And the state protected that common property, which is not done, for instance, in African context, as, as I know. 
There, after colonial times and also in the neoliberal age, it's clear, first, uh, during colonial times and post-colonial times, resources become state property. So fisheries are no longer local property, but become state property. This is why external people can come and say, well, I'm a citizen of, the, of this country, I can use the fish as I want. And to local people, you're not the ones telling me how to fish. And then, as um, these states get into crisis, structural adjustment programs, etc. The state is not able to monitor, to sanction, um, uh, actually, uh, overuse of the resources. These resources then become either um, privatized or they become de facto open access. Again, the picture which you saw in Zambia, this is now an open access situation from a state uh, property context. The state is not able to actually guarantee um, a secured uh, management of the fishery, so people from outside just come and do what they want and overuse the, the fishery resources, which is at the detriment for local people and as well actually uh, for the, the, the fishing resources. So having this literature which we discussed, we came, and this is a lot of text and I'm sorry for this, I know I'm going to push you a little bit to the edge, but I, I will read it to you, so I hope you will see the main, the main points. SDG 15 has um, the parts which are not um, um, actually uh, bold, um, which were there, protect, restore, and remedy the sustainable use of terrestrial, and then comes resource. And we said, no, let's formulate this differently, together with the students. Let's say, use of terrestrial cultural landscape ecosystems, and the land and interrelated common pool resources, and recognize that these have been managed by local common property institutions, while acknowledging property rights change and loss of access for local actors. Because what we have now, we don't have a common property management system in Zambia and the fisheries. This is no longer common property because that property has been taken away by the state. So you can go and say, hey, people, do sustainable use of the fisheries. And they say, hey, we, we can't. These people from outside come and do fishing with these nets. So we are not, we're not empowered to do so. So this is really important, you know. And also, um, this aspect, um, this should be achieved by recognizing scientific and local ecological knowledge. This is also a very important thing which I got from uh, Melissa and James and us also during my research. Local people really have a profound knowledge. I mean, this is common sense a little bit, but nobody really pays attention to it. You know, you say, okay, in a project, the ecological knowledge is okay, but hardly ever in the project it's really looked at and it really has consequences. So this is very important as well. This is important for cross-checking and securing degradation history. So let's check how actually it came about that in Zambia, the fish stock is going down. What's the story? How did it happen? We need to know that. We can't just say what's going down. We have the figures. Tilapia bream uh, had been uh, numerous there, and now we only find two, two, three um, species there. Uh, this is not enough. We need to know that history. And also, by charging responsible actors, specifically the state and powerful market-oriented actors, for processes of sustainable land use, because the blame is often on the people but not actually on those who initiated that, that process. So halt and reverse degradation and halt um, diversity loss by creating, that's also in the text. We reformulated this as newly locally participatory developed institutions, meaning um, discuss with people what happened, trying to know from them how they would rephrase or reframe the institutional setting and technology to generate collective ownership for a more sustainable use. This is now a lot because this is a very, very central and important SDG for most uh, of actually the debates. And you see, I mean, perhaps it's too much. I know uh, it's sort of challenging as well. Um, it's a lot of text. But I think it was very good because the students really came up with these points. It's not that I was formulating this. It was the, it was, was the students actually picking up elements from uh, different texts which we were reading that they came up with, with, with that formulation. So this is not... Uh, my achievement, it's a co-achievement together with these uh, 30, 30 students. I have uh, a very quick example from Forestry also to show the, the, the idea. So SDG 15.2 says, by 2020, promote the implementation of sustainable management of all types of forests. Halt forestation, restore degraded forests and sustainability, increase afforestation and reforestation globally. After reading about a lot of literature regarding forestry, etc., we said, okay, we need to reformulate this. We were writing then. By 2020, promote the local discussion and implementation of bottom-up institution building, including local property rights for... We erased that one. We don't know longer 
have to talk about sustainability because that is defined by someone else and not by local people. So we just kick it out. I mean, that's something which we can discuss. Property rights for the management of all types of forests, halt um, deforestation, etc. That's again the, the old uh, thing. Degraded forests and sustainability increase afforestation and reforestation globally. That's the old version. And we change it to based on the fair distribution of cost and benefit without being used by governments and NGOs for conservation and to blame and evict local people. I mean, you all know also the work of um, uh, Melissa and James and, and Ian Schoons regarding this green development thing. That's the point. There's a danger there. You know, uh, a lot of um, governments say, well, everything is participatory, and also NGOs say this, and then they set up something which is actually not really participatory, which is then used to actually um, evict people. So there's a danger there, and I, or we wanted to actually to have this um, in there. Do you have any question regarding this? I know I'm running fast, and I will perhaps also, seeing the time, then stop at a certain point, because I think you will then after a while realize what the idea is about, or what the principle is about. But can you still follow? Is it okay? Otherwise, you tell me if I'm too, I tend to be <laughs> uh, too fast a little bit. So the second point we were discussing was the land grab debate. Commons and what we call, this is also so something which you can uh, think, well, what the hell is this? Resilience grabbing. What we mean is actually what is taken away is not just land here, the, the crumb which you see um, on this picture, but also a lot of um, this pasture, there are animals there, there are well products there, which, you, which is then gone away. And often these resources are important for women or for marginal people to make their livelihoods and to generate money and food also in times of need, in times of crisis. This is why we say it's not just commons removed, it's also the resilience capacity removed. Perhaps this term is a bit, I've been uh, actually um, aggressed that I write something that is not found in Google. <laughs> so someone told me, I didn't find this in Google, so you can't use it because it's not found in Google. So, um, well, perhaps I should put it into Gimme, but that, that was the basic idea. Again, this is a lot of text, but just showing you, actually, we read then papers linked to SDG 7, Affordable Green Energy, SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, and 9, Industry Innovation Infrastructure, um, with related to debate on large-scale land acquisition or land grabbing. This is broad literature in the Journal of Peasant Studies. I don't have to tell you, you might know uh, most of this literature. What we read was a paper by White and all who actually showed how new investments create new enclosures, that actually these investments are said to be important uh, because they bring um, development, they bring transportation, but as a matter of fact, uh, people lose their land and they don't profit from this new investment. I think that's the key thing. If they would profit from it, I think they would say, well, Perhaps we lose something, but we gain something, you know. It's not that local people, um, as far as we have experienced in our research, are against uh, development. This is already also nicely shown in a Swiss um, case company called Adax in Sierra Leone. People in Sierra Leone, they, they were actually quite happy when the company came. After all that war and all that turmoil, etc., now something is coming, you know. Um, but in the end, they realized they don't get access to land anymore. They don't get jobs. Uh, and, and actually, they lose access to several resources, such as water, for instance. Women using water in the swampy area to do irrigation, to sell um, vegetables, suddenly they don't have this water anymore. Or people collecting palm fruits in order to produce oil to sell it on the market. That's important because they don't have a job. This might uh, be looking at or be looked at as it's just small things which are not important. For local people, it's very important if they have this additional dollar or two, three dollars or not. It decides on whether you can send your kids to school, buy clothes or buy medicine. I mean, that's really important. So this is also interesting because the students, um, um, uh, Marfort um, et al, these were uh, also students of mine who in the beginning said, well, Perhaps it's not just a bad thing, but the longer they stayed, the more they realized this is just a very bad deal. This is a deal that no Swiss and German farmer would actually be engaged with because it's taking away the best land, water, uh, for, for um, bread and butter and for nothing else. So if you would go to a Swiss farmer and propose the same deal, he would say, uh, please go and use the F word that you, that you go away, you know. Um, actually, there's a, uh, there's a movie where it was tried to show the 
uh, actually the other, the other way around, that an African goes dressed very nicely and says, well, I want to buy your land, your land is wasteland, it's nothing worse, so give it to me, and etc. And it shows the reaction of, of farmers in Europe. They would say, well, this is not a good deal. Why am I, should I be so stupid, you know, to, to actually do that deal? This is many, you know, many times, um, I mean, I could go on with these cases. We had a lot of research on large-scale land acquisition and uh, sustainable uh, food systems, etc. And there you come across many situations where you think, oh, Monty Python is running all around Africa. You have John Glees uh, everywhere, you know, with stupid things, things which don't make sense. And people say, well, why are we engaged in this? I will stop it here, perhaps in the discussion, I will, can give well, one or two examples. And perhaps this comedy is perhaps also one thing which, which is a weapon, you know. I mean, I think we also have to show what's, what's going on in these contexts. Um, the thing, well, they're also addicts. They promised actually to pay a lot to produce jobs. Uh, there's a, a de development project there, you know, rice producing. People need rice. We do produce biofuels for the European market. Europe then later on realized, oh, biofuel might not be so good, so we stop it. And then they had a problem. Actually, ADAX was promised to be the best investment case whatsoever, you know. They got rewards, etc. Now they're gone. They're no longer there, you know. This is also, I mean, vulnerability of companies coming in, changing the whole thing, and then they can't manage. Although everybody said it's best practice, and then they're gone because they're not viable. But then they set up a de development scheme, rice um, cultivation. But this rice cultivation was relied to modern technique, to a tractor, which was always failing. So people were not producing rice, but they had to repay for the tractor and for the inputs. In the end, they didn't have any money anymore and were indebted, you know. I mean, that's then the reality, so uh, what the hell is this? But you have in all these cases legitimacy producing discourses. It's food security, it's energy efficiency, green economy, etc. Um, all these, and it's not just in these um, settings regarding uh, large um, agriculture system, but also in mining. Um, Niederberger et al. compiled um, a book with about 13 cases that shows that actually how mining um, is, is working. There's one paper from Howald and Boskin that shows in, in Venezuela how transnational companies use the same discourse that actually fit very, very nicely sustainable development goals. You could just replace them. What they say on their website, this is sustainable development goals. So here you are with, with actually the anti-politics uh, anti machines. One also must say that all these things, I mean, people are not just sitting there and, and watching what's going on. There's a lot of local reactions, um, uh, resistance, etc. And um, Hall et al., June Boris is also uh, author of, of this paper. And also in the paper of Marfort um, et al., these are, are my students. Actually, they show these, uh, these reactions, for instance, um, in one, one or the other way. I will come to details perhaps later on. So... How should we, out of this, reformulate then the, the, the SDGs, SDG 7 and 9? SDG 7 is described as ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. What's about external, externalities? What's about the question of power? Nothing is found in there. And it's not me being polemic. I mean, if you go to those areas after a while, you realize that people are just excluded from access to that, these resources. We have one research in, in Morocco, the largest solar energy um, investment um, in the whole world, financed also by the European Union, etc. People gave their land, they received very little money, there is no job, and they don't even receive energy, you know. They're sitting there, and when my students started, some people said, well, it might be good. Uh, women thought, well, we might get some projects, etc. Now there's nothing, no jobs, no land, which was used for pasture. No access to energy, they pay for electricity. What the hell is this? And they have paid really very, very little uh, money for, 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 their, for their land. And um, this is really something which is important. So we reformulated this regarding um, the following phrase, ensure access to energy and the reliability thereof for all, based on participatory processes so that the more powerful actors, transnational companies, etc., are not able to externalize costs. And now I'm talking economics language, you know. I'm not saying, well, culture, no, 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 no. They say, yes, of course, we, we set up, uh, you know, uh, some schemes where uh, we, we pay for that, that women can do in Morocco some traditional knitting. That's for women. That's really nice. So this is fine. Um, in Morocco, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Uh, one of the corporate social responsibility um, project was also to organize a marathon run 
a marathon run, you have to do it correctly. A marathon run for local people. That's nice, this is an event, you know? I mean, you're laughing now, this is so absurd. It's really absurd. You know, we're sitting there, uh, 35 CSR projects, what they do good. They say, we do this. Uh, this is not that we are forced to do. We do this free or the free will. Okay? I mean, this is like, and I don't know, who of you knows Monty Python? I mean, there's some younger people here. Who of you still know Monty Python? Okay. There, there, this, uh, you know, perhaps this, this uh, Ministry of Silly Walks uh, series, you know? What's a silly walk? The guy comes in and says, I want to patent the silly walk, and John Cleese gets up. This is not a silly walk. I'll show you what the silly walk is. So th this is really, and you sit there in these offices, and they tell you these stories, what they do. And then you sit there and think, what the hell are we doing here, you know? I mean, you shouldn't say, well, this is really crap, but you, as a social anthropologist, this is participant observation, you know? <laughs> you sort of watch and see. i stop it here, sorry. Um, Moving away, sorry for that. SDG number nine, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive, sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Each and every company can put that really big screen on their homepage. Everybody, I wouldn't know any, I mean, Novartis says they're doing this, you know, uh, even Monsanto is saying they're doing this, you know. Uh, Syngenta is doing this. When you uh, happen to come to Switzerland and you fly over, over Basel, and Syngenta pays a lot also for that airport, you see big, big screens. We do sustainable development. We feed the people, etc., etc. It's not me sort of stressing, stretching the argument. Just look around. It's, it's like this. So we reformulated it. Build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation as long as it does not harm um, residents or local residents. In order to achieve this aim, greater participation in decision making is required to preclude land grabbing uh, by the state or by national or international companies. So that's the way we're, where we try to, to reformulate it. So, I don't know, um, is it um, okay for you if I call, go on and show you another example and then we see if perhaps you're already tired um, and, and then I can stop, we can start discussing. For me, it's like that you realize the way we approach the, 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 the whole thing. If it's okay, I do another one and then you, you tell me when the time is ripe. Um, we come to the section climate change debate and I just take this um, as a starter, uh, actually what we saw in some of the literature is that as a matter of fact, there's a higher impact by um, urban context and agro-industrial food systems than by small-scale um, food system, which are also addressed in many of the SDGs. And I think that's really important because, again, the anti-politics machine, 11, 12, and 13 can be used very nicely by governments, uh, actually also to control local people, to say, well, you should do A, B, C, D, we control you so that you are sustainable. And it's okay, this is a justification, because we want to lead you to sustainable food production. You know? And companies are also okay, because we need to feed the world. Who the hell is we? I mean, is it ADAX who tried to do biofuel and then actually failed? before they got, uh, you know, they, they got some uh, certificates, they are the best of the best, and now they fail. Nobody talks about ADAX anymore. When we did research about ADAX, I got an email from the co-CEO of ADAX that I should stop doing harmful research in the area. <laughs> that my students are not well trained, they're just running around asking questions. <laughs> this is not serious research, you know, they're not asking for figures, you know. This is, not, this is not science. And that he is going to write to actually the rector of the University of Bern, what stupid type of research <laughs> those social anthropologists are doing. That they're very disappointed. That scientists can do such a thing. Sorry, I'm it's getting me into comedian. Uh, we, I'll continue here. So we had literature also regarding uh, cities and their emissions, consumption, food systems, etc. SDG 11. Um, climate change initiatives such as RED and RED Plus. Um, we had a very interesting text from Wiesnetal 2015 regarding um, participatory development of smaller um, peri-urban areas. Um, and as these are actually urbanized, smaller ur urbanization tends to be much better also in the context of uh, climate change mitigation than these large uh, settings. And then comes a paper which I think is really interesting. I don't know if you know uh, that paper of uh, Vermeulen et al. Uh, 2012. I don't know if some of you otherwise I recommend this reading because it starts very natural science-wise, you know, 
have a look at what is the CO2 output, etc. And then as, as long as you re continue reading, you realize that actually it's not the local agriculture techniques of shifting cultivation, because shifting cultivation, that's one of, in, in Asia, for instance, and also in Latin America, that is enemy number one. You know? mm -hmm. They are killing the forests. Bad, bad, bad. Um, but he, then they show actually the driver of this climate change uh, is the one that actually large-scale agriculture and industrial production creates much more and greater emission and destroys much, much more forests than these smallholders do. Although in the rhetoric, many times these smallholders say, well, shifting cultivation should not be practiced anymore, you know. I mean, if people own the land and have access to the land, they do this in rotation and they create cultural landscapes for, for instance, um, um, fauna can come back in old gardens to feed themselves. We know this from many work from, from, from the Amazon. Um, actually, in the 90s, there were interesting research calling the Amazon also as a cultural landscape ecosystems, you know. Um, and, and we don't see this anymore because it's so lowly populated. It had been much higher populated before. I don't know who of you still knows the name of Alexander von Humboldt. Is that something that you... I mean, on his journeys, he saw actually what was happening. He was heavily criticizing the, the Spanish, but people were still around. He were, so he was interested in the way people are using these landscapes, transforming. They were actually trying to understand what they're doing. And from these descriptions and from other descriptions as well, we know that these areas were much, much more populated than they are today. You know? So, I mean, again, history, history matters here. Good. So... Um, on SDG 13, uh, national policies um, uh, related to red and red plus, we looked at the disjunction politics due to ignoring local context. There's a very nice paper for Secor and Com in Vietnam who say, okay, by the end, um, the red plus initiative led to the conservation of an area which was completely deforested. There was no forest anymore, but it was actually <laughs> protected under the red plus. I mean, again, a very, very, a very cynical uh, constellation. Similar thing with Marquardt and Payne, 2016 in Nepal. So states measures for red and red plus can create inadequate conditions and increase also deforestation owning to failure to involve local actors. Because what happened here, Sikor et al. showed that the local people wanted to protect another forest. But then the red, red people uh, said, no, this is not interesting. So they protected some, another area where there was no forest at all. And in the end, the other forest got destroyed. Great achievement. Huh? So, um, and um, this last point, I did a comparative study related to a project with uh, a German organization. They had a look at um, actually um, pro poor climate change initiatives uh, in, in about um, eight to 10 areas, and I did a, a comparison then. And for me, it became clear that the capacity of climate change resilience to sort of being able to uh, actually cope with changes in the, in the, um, in the, in the, with weather conditions, etc. If this is climate change or not, this is another issue. But resilience there was not based on the state, but on the diversity and strengths of local rules and regulation regarding access to resources. If these were still working in the cases, people were much more resilient. If people were kicked away or lost access to those resources, they were really prone to all those changes, you know. So that is, again, a very, very important finding. It's not me arguing uh, before everything was better, now everything is bad. But here we have serious things. You know, we talk about making people more resilient. They had resilience capacities. And we, well, if I say we, um, actually the, the neoliberal uh, capitalist uh, process sort of undermines this. And I think this is very important. Access to the commons was very important there and, um, and ensuring um, local resource um, rights. So um, we come to three reformulations. The one is from 1113 by 2030, enhance inclusive and sustainable urbanization and the capacity for, we put here, local participatory integrated and sustainable human settlement planning. This can also be planned participatory. There's no use that, you know, uh, city planning must be always top down. And I think it's also better lo to include local people because then uh, something better might, might come up, you know, because they also have knowledge about these things. Integrated and sustainable human settlement planning and management in all countries in order, that's what we changed, to generate local environments that are lifeable and empower local decision making. That's what we change. We think you can't do urbanization just over the top of the people. You need to actually in involve them. 
And this is me again uh, being Swiss, you know, if it's discussed what's happening to zoning in a village where I stay, I know I'm asked, I can go and see the maps. That's what I did about, about two months ago. They told me you can go and see the map and see what area around you will be rezoned. And I have the possibility to say, no, I'm not happy with that, you know. I mean, this is something which is normal for me, but I realize if I go abroad, I don't know how it is in the UK. This is not normal. So I think this is very uh, important. Then we have 12. Uh, one, implement the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption production, all countries taking action. And then we deleted with developed countries taking the lead, taking into account the development and capabilities of developing countries. We said, no, let's do away with that. We rewrote it, working in partnership together and ensuring equal possibilities of bargaining power for all countries. Of course, we have governments, etc. We need to uh, actually contextualize this. But then strict use of the principle of a uh, principle that actors producing the highest impact shall also take the larger share in mitigating climate change's influencing factor. I mean, this is a point which a lot of countries actually say. Um, I mean, the whole emission thing, you know that. But that should be in the SDG. It's not there. It's not there. It's simply not there. And this is a very old discussion. Uh, you remember uh, the, the, the governments of the small islands in the, in the Pacific running around? Because for them, it matters if it's two, three, or four degrees. I mean, it's about uh, <laughs> the water is here or it is here, you know. I don't have to tell you this. And then the last thing, integrate climate change measures into national policies, strategies, and planning, and integrate climate change measures into national policies. Okay. But we changed via a participatory process of developing strategies and planning procedures at all governmental levels, but especially in the local forms of government and using locally developed uh, institutions, rules and regulations, and again, um, ecolog ec ecological uh, knowledge. So that was the third part. Um, I don't know, I think uh, when I look at your faces, you might <laughs> have enough of that dose. Um, otherwise, I, I could also come to the participatory aspect that might be something which is important, and then to the conclusion. Is that okay? I would skip two. I know it's heavy, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not me writing the SDGs, it's me or us rewriting the SDGs, you know, it's not, I mean, uh, if they would have been lighter, perhaps uh, I wouldn't be here and boring you <laughs> any, any longer. So, um, well, very quickly, um, what I wanted to show is uh, here the issue of, of hunger, etc., which is also important. <laughs> Um, is actually that in traditional systems and also in modern systems, there are sharing reciprocity and risk re reduction strategy which are not included and which are undermined. Here, picture from Zambia where I did my field work, a funeral where um, animals are slaughtered and animal wealth is redistributed, you know, which is uh, something that also Ferguson hints at. And I think something that social anthropologists can tell to a broader audience, you know, there are systems of redistribution. And, um, for instance, there's, there's these, there are these big man systems in Melanesia, etc. I was also wondering uh, why not having some of those uh, big guys saying, okay, you're a big man, so please redistribute. Your fame, you know, the Microsoft guy, your fame is actually based on you. I mean, he gives, him and his wife, they give quite a bit. So Swiss Tropical Public Health Institute, they're very happy about this. But it's just, I mean... Perhaps I'm being mean. Perhaps it's something where you can deduct from taxes. Uh, I won't go on, I'll stop it here. But the thing is really much more could be distributed. And we know from social anthropology cases that um, people really want to have prestige. They give it all away, you know? And these systems work well because there's a really big redistribution. They get the prestige, let them have the prestige. I don't have a problem with that couple having a lot of prestige, if they don't bother me, that's fine, you know. But uh, let them redistribute the money. Good. I go further here. Um, here, this is this issue of um, actually politics of distribution, a, a world of uh, 1%, etc. etc. You, you know this. I, I skipped that. Um, so basis for redistribution, perhaps this is an important point, what we discussed, should be first what is needed? What do local people really want? What type of development do they really want? For what should the money be used for? We don't just know this, I think. Well, i still doing research in Zambia and elsewhere. I'm not sure for what exactly people would like to have money. You know, can throw money uh, at people. Ferguson says, bring in a basic income 
from the South African research, and then people know what to do about it. That might be one thing, but we need to discuss this. Discuss this, and then second, how it should be done locally, where the money should be on the north, uh, in the south, in all those other countries. I think this is, a, this is an important point. Okay, I come to this uh, in, 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 um, initi local initiative and participatory debate, local ownership of institution <laughs> building. You see here a picture, my wife and I, we have been involved in research regarding fisheries in Zambia. It was clear that people don't have access to the fish, etc., because it's no longer their common property. Their rules and regulations, how to maintain this, were undermined by people coming from outside. And then people told us, what are we going to do now? We did some nice research together with you. We know now the better picture because we did it together. But now you go, you go to Europe, Switzerland, you write your work, you write your papers, you make your academic career, what's in it now for us? And through that we were actually pushed together with local um, people from the fishery department that uh, we said, okay, there's this issue that local bylaws can, for, the, for the fisheries can be drafted locally to the national fishery laws. And then we had this initiative because we knew the society, we knew the political structure, that we asked the people, would you be interested to discuss amongst interest groups how the fishery in Zambia, in your area, should be managed. And this is a picture of one of the meetings. Um, this is a um, collaborator of uh, which we had. He explains the idea, not in the sense of you should do good fisheries, but in the sense of would you be interested to discuss this? Uh, we just give you the platform, because often women are not speaking up. Um, people who are politically not on the same level, they're not speaking up. So amongst themselves, discuss and come up with ideas how you want to, this to be managed. Um, that process is described uh, in this uh, article uh, of my wife and I. If you are interested, um, have a look at this. So we were uh, reading that type of things, and we were actually, um, I, I skipped this now, we were actually trying then to rephrase the SDG 17, which says, strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. A very nice term. Each and every company can subscribe to this. It contains global partnerships, including international solidarity, well, transfer of technology and more fair tax. This is something which I think is good, more fair tax and trade policies. But what is that? What is more fair? Who defines what is more fair? Um, it should cut across all SDGs, which is laudable, if it really does, and enable the concretization of other SDGs. We thought, okay, let's completely reformulate this. Um, perhaps we're deadly wrong, but we made the try. We said, okay, strengthen local bottom-up capacities and in initiatives in all SDGs to create the condition for real participatory processes and innovations regarding the governance of resources, <coughs> paying attention uh, to local plural needs. In a local setting, you have different needs. You need to address them. Women, youth, uh, you name it, have different, uh, different ideas, different needs. Enabling the capacity of all interest groups to address their views, needs, and knowledge by being open to fusing all the new rules. That's something which they came up in Zambia. Some of the old rules regarding fishery, we want to keep them. Others we want to do away. Um, as a matter of fact, new people are coming into the area, they bring sicknesses and they are loud and uh, create problems. So we want law and order and we want health and sanitation. We want the government to help us with this. So this is very innovative. It's not, you know, keeping the old thing, everything old is good. It's not that way if you discuss with people. Very, uh, very interesting. Fusing all the new rules in the crafting processes as well as knowledge, um, acknowledging what has been developed at the state and at the international level. It's not saying everything is bad also on the state level. This issue of the bylaws in Zambia for the fishery, that's a good thing, to have the possibility of creating bylaws because that gives an entry point for local participation. So that is a good thing. And we have to detect what, it, what is good. The problem there was when we wanted to scale it up and have it ratified, you had the fishery department people, they thought they didn't get money uh, from uh, the NGO that helped us to set that up, so they were blocking everything. So we had a very good process and then hit our head <laughs> on, on the very top. And uh, now the whole achievement, um, we describe it here, has mixed, uh, mixed results. Good. Thus, the role for the state and NGOs is not to enable... Um, is, sorry. Thus, the role of the state and the NGO is to enable such processes of discussions locally and gain back trust for partnerships. 
you talk about partnerships. I mean, if you go to, uh, to Sierra Leone or, or to Morocco and say, well, uh, I'm from the government and we are partners now, they just laugh at you, you know. Perhaps not openly, that if you stay longer, they tell you, well, what type of partnership is this? Um, gain back trust, because that trust is completely uh, 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 undermined. And uh, from Butley, we take that small nations and effective systems of decentralization, not the decentralization which you see now in Kenya, for instance, which is decentralization. So just do everything yourself and the money is at the central government and you have to fight over money, etc. a basis for corruption. But the real decentralization um, should be uh, the effective systems of decentralization might provide ideas as to such a, a process. So I come to the end. I'm sorry, I really stretched it a bit. Um, in the conclusion, I have um, several points. If we return to the preamble, we could say uh, a new politics of distribution is needed because it reduces poverty more effectively than any development or social health program, as it reduces the transaction costs also for such distribution. So if we have an idea on how to distribute, James Ferguson has an idea, some people agree, others might not agree, but it's an interesting point. Then um, be, um, it reduces disparities according to gender, wealth, and education, as everybody would receive the same amount unconditionally. That's uh, Ferguson's point. And C, reduced stigma of rich and poor, as everyone receives a rightful share of the wealth. This is an interesting point. It's not, it's not a help. It's not the North helping the South. It's saying, okay, let's have a fair share, because, I mean, every uh, clothes that you're wearing my coming from somewhere <laughs> where people are badly, badly paid. Even some things that I'm wearing, I mean, I'm, I'm not different than you. So it's not help, it's a rightful share to pay more. And actually, the, the, the clothes that I'm wearing, perhaps they're not more expensive. If those who get the money in between uh, actually uh, don't take that much, we still pay the same thing. You know, all this fair trade coffee thing uh, makes, me, makes me sick because if you do a value chain analysis and you see I have a Starbucks coffee here, I pay, I don't know, how, do, how much do you pay? In Switzerland, you pay five, six francs, which, which is about four, four pounds or something. Of that four pounds, it's not even a cent that goes to, goes to the farmer. What the hell of system is this? You know? I mean, you know that this as well. I don't tell, I'm not talking in from, uh, front of an audience who doesn't know. But I think in the SDGs, it's not in there for me. So why the hell are we running behind the SDGs and now being a bit polemic and not addressing this issue? We should know better. And we should use our power to say, well, this is not correct, you know. So, and D for me is very important because I think we are there in a dilemma. It would reduce that redistribution, the problem of double pressure of the poor, overusing resources owing to poverty, which is created powerfully, and the rich overusing the resources due to their desire for high gain investment. So if I'm sitting on a lot of money, I'm in stress, I'm a poor guy, because I have to look how this money is nicely invested. What the hell am I doing? You know? well, where do I put the money? I was in this position not because I'm rich, but because I was the director of the Swiss Network of International Studies in Geneva for about two years. It was the time when the United Bank of Switzerland was about to going down, because they bought very bad papers, and the government had to get these papers and had to save them. I told these to my boss because that was research money from the Confederation and from the Canton of Geneva. I was sitting on that money and I told them, listen, I have heard it's now problematic and we have this account with the United Bank of Switzerland. And what happens if that bank goes down the drain? Well, all Switzerland will go down the drain. Don't you bother? I said, I, I, but I do bother. This is research money. These are my fellow colleagues who have to stop the research projects if I don't pay attention. And I'm the director. I'm the one that is responsible. No, 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 don't care. Then three weeks later, in the evening, about 11 o'clock uh, p.m., I, I get a phone call of one of the six um, supervisors, which I have. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps it might be good. You had this idea of taking the money somewhere else. Perhaps it would be good to <laughs> take these steps. And uh, they were laughing at me because we have a so-called alternative bank. Ha-ha, you want to go to an alternative bank? I mean, what type of banking do this? Then we decided for the Raiffeisen Bank. I don't know if you know this, which is a more cooperative bank. And then the secretary and I, we went there and said, okay, we want to get the money from the United Bank of Switzerland. We want to deposit it then there. I said, yes, good organization. We have this offer for you. 
investment in sustainable energy. And I was so stupid, didn't pay attention to that. Okay, good. As long as the money is somewhere else and some, some safe place, it's okay. But where did that money go to? It went into biofuel production. Huh? And I said yes, and I signed. So I should have known better. And um, uh, finishing um, with this uh, point, I think I have some other conclusions, but I think I'll leave it here so that we can have time for discussions. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. And we came exactly. to the view that actually the inequality goal, goal 10, was actually a central goal, which actually if you didn't address it would mean that you couldn't actually achieve any of the other goals. Mm -hmm. And your overall conclusion that a politics of distribution is key to yep. all the SDGs yep. I think is very yep. interesting. The other related exercise I've been involved in was with um, a large group of colleagues who were formed the Science Committee of Future Earth, the big initiative for global sustainability where we've just produced a paper about the relationships between equity and sustainability and basically made a similar argument about the politics of distribution being key and looked at some similar dynamics through which maldistribution actually mm. undermined achievement mm -hmm. of other SDGs and, and came to the conclusion that actually, again, equity needed to be at the heart of all of yeah. these. Yeah. And actually, as part of that, we had an appendix that in a similar way, analysed, we didn't go as far as reformulating them, but we looked at which SDGs and targets talked about equity and which didn't. And it was really striking that those to do with land, climate change, water, in a sense, the more natural science-y ones, yep. had no mention Nothing. of equity within them. Void, completely void. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you've gone a long way further in thinking about, about kind of mm. the equity dimension. Mm. But I'm sure there are questions, and there might also be some challenges with respect to actually the faith that is placed here in the bottom-up and the participatory, which is very familiar and very appealing, I think, to a lot of the discussions we have at IDS, but, but maybe might be a little bit naive. Are there some questions might yep. want, one might want to ask about the politics of participation? Yep. Anyway, those are questions I've got, but let's open it up. Let's take a round of questions or comments. Uh, one of the best um, sets of work and presentations I've heard um, for a long time. In its honesty, I, mm. I think you know you, you say you're lapsing into polemic. I, I, mm -hmm. I think your polemic is backed up by evidence. I, I think it's absolutely crucial. But not only that, there are three quick points. Mm -hmm. The first is that what ADAX was doing in Sierra Leone yep. is it, it's been going on for decades. You could go yeah. back to the 50s in Tanganyika with the exactly. ground nuts. You could go to the Sahel. French yeah. ex colonies in the 70s. It's an old history. With, yeah. with that. This has been going on for decades, mm -hmm. and the fact that you know, it's still happening is absolutely scary and disgusting in, in that way. So, mm -hmm. so that's the, the first yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, and if they're scared of you, then that's great. And if you're <laughs> embarrassing them, you, you need to do as much as you can. Uh, the, the second point is that I'm, I'm trying to popularize what I call a concept of the cure to damage ratio. So this is how much money is spent in development work to cure a problem mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how much money is being spent to create the damage that we're supposed cure to cure. Cure damage. Mm -hmm. And in this, certainly in climate change, in public spending, the cure to damage ratio is around one to 5,000. In other words, one billion dollars gets spent on helping poor countries to adapt to climate yep, change, yep. while five trillion dollars is spent on making climate change worse. Now, you can do that with CSR, so you can look at how much is being spent on it by a corporation yeah. like CSR to massage their image exactly. compared with the value of the damage they're doing to the common exactly. the yeah. livelihoods yeah. that you've identified. Exactly. Uh, then the third is Melissa's point about participation.
Nations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is because you were focused more on Sub-Saharan Africa, but if you were looking at <coughs> almost all Asia or Latin, 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 yeah. Latin America, the, the image of participation is that it is somehow virtuous. Yeah. Um, but power exists at the local level as well. Exactly. And, and so participation cannot overcome the problem that if you've got unequal land tenure, exactly. power at the local level, that power exactly. is in danger of being embedded yeah. in the participation. Yeah. Absolutely. I completely agree. May I pick up on this last yeah, point should, quickly? Should we just take a few yep. okay. so we can get some yep. discussion Thank you. Especially because I'm taking on James Fairhead class on um, environmental debate right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions. So um, a lot of it is regarding his question mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. like he was talking about kilogram edge ratio, but how about like the money they spend on repairing the concept of repairing? Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. like there are ways. Um, there are two concepts of conservation. One is for pure conservation, just keeping the place, so that's not touching it. Mm -hmm, the other mm -hmm. one is creating a conservation area to repair damage of the developing, uh, developed countries and so yeah. on. So Half, how do you yeah. spend mm -hmm. there? And the second one is about um, you, um, your students, and you had a really good criticism on the SDG, how they work mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. stuff. And um, there are a lot of space for improvement and reformulation, but because of the formality of the UN um, goals, mm -hmm, is it mm -hmm. possible? Yeah. And if not, it will be totally up to the goodwill of the actors in SDGs. Yeah. So that comes to the naiveness of participation yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Because of course. the actors can kind of define what participation means. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. no, this is power issue. I'll come back to, to that point. It's a central point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. On the negotiation method, that the text would, would stay or it would be skipped? It would be, would be skipped, I'm, I'm sure it yeah. would be skipped. Yeah. This is why we, we call it an experiment, you know. We, we sort of, and that's, if I may pick, yeah, pick it up, absolutely. and that's also relating, uh, I mean, you, you can fairly, and I'm also at this point, one can fairly criticize us of naivety, but. Actually, that was not the aim. The aim was, and perhaps this is not okay, one can be criticized, but the aim was, let's now have a look at, well, it's not state of the art, we made the selection of literature. Let's have a look what is happening. If we read that and if we would do the reformulation. I, we didn't think about what could happen, and I think it's also, I mean, also uh, some people within CDE are not, perhaps I'm misreading that, but I have the impression, yeah. not so keen on what we on what we did you know um, we see we, we're going to have a discussion with them um, I simply can't tell you what the next steps will be I simply can't tell you I mean it was really it was really an exercise and students and myself I was fascinated about about the way how creatively they, they were writing those things you know I mean 90% of those things came from those 30 students and not from myself you know just just to be so uh, we don't know what's going on with it. And I think perhaps this naivety that we don't reflect, we do something. But uh, on the other hand, who are we? I mean, uh, the Institute of Social Anthropology might be a Im more important one in the German-speaking social anthropology area. What's social anthropology anyway in the academic field? Sorry to say, you know. And, and what's, what's the German-speaking area uh, when it comes to ranking? So I, I don't think that this will really be uh, picked up. And if I think, again, what we postulate is that it should be widely discussed. And again, we will see how these power games unfold. If that happens, we will see. But the point we're making with participatory, 
and I think that's a very good point uh, which, which um, you raised. And this is what we were doing in here, is that we are not naive about political and power constellations on the local ground. The, this uh, approach which we call constitutionality is um, that actually came from that um, initiative in Zambia regarding the fisheries, is us knowing if we just go to a local chief who has a colonial uh, past, actually he has, his four forefathers have been implemented by the British government. So a lot of people are not for that chief, think he's a crook. If we just go and say, okay, dear chief, you represent the population and now discuss fisheries you would have something where 50 or more percent of the people would say, well, I don't be part of this one. Us knowing that, um, we were taking another way. We knew who were the interest groups, also regarding women, gender issues, very, very sensitive because fishery is an important thing for, for women. And men, because they know that fish is high value, they even pick up the baskets, which is, which is the women's fishing technology, to get the fish because you get more fish with the basket and to sell it. I mean, women are outraged that men are doing this, you know. And it's really strange because uh, 20, 30 years before, a man would feel, oh, I'm not a woman, you know. I go with the spear, I'm the man. I'm not taking the basket of the woman to do fishes. But that you know, can make money. This is now a way. Uh, this is now not, not relevant. But knowing these differences, we were uh, asking actually people in these interest groups, we create a platform for you to freely speak up. It's not us saying you should do ABC. It's are you interested to discuss amongst yourselves how, according to you, these fisheries should be managed? And then what we did, we helped to pool those ideas. I mean, we created, actually, we were uh, catalyzing agents. We were in this, you know, power-specific mess who gets bigger and bigger since <coughs> colonial times up to now. Not saying that before colonial times there were no power differences. There were huge power differences. But they were negotiated. The big man, he couldn't do anything he wanted because he would lose follower to the other. So he had to distribute, he had to engage local people. This is what we know from social anthropology. If we take these systems seriously, you know, um, political anthropology tells us a lot about these dynamics. And that dynamic, I mean, chiefs in Zambia are now like little kings. They behave like little kings, they dress up like little kings, they move around with cars like, like little, little kings. They were not little kings, they were reliable. And if they don't have things to distribute, uh, then they also get into trouble, which was uh, that chief, he also got into trouble uh, doing our research. But the point was, we did not exclude him. We also involved him, but him and his people. They also were discussing how to manage the fisheries, and then we pooled everything, and then everybody had this sense of ownership of that process and of these institutions. This is also <coughs> uh, my institution, and not just the institution of the of, of the opposition leader or of the chief or of the man. So everybody could see themselves in there. And this is a bit the process which we have in Switzerland. I explained this uh, yesterday to, to Melissa and to James. We call this in German, and this is a complicated word, even the Germans don't know what it means, Vernehmlassungsverfahren. Vernehmlassung means, if you translate it, um, you want to get the opinion by a large public. And Verfahren is a process. It's a process. So you want to get the position of everybody through a process and you sort of pool this and then you set up something. You don't set up something just scientists say, well, uh, maximum sustainable fisheries is at, I don't know, six metric, thousand metric tons and a few flats and that's it. This is nonsense, you know, you should really discuss this. And also, when are closing times for fisheries? Um, during the rainy season, that's, that might be good, but there are certain areas where fish are reproducing so those have been protected in the traditional system, but in other systems, for women, it was vital to be able to fish. But the fishery department, what do they do? They say, well, during, between um, December and January, no fishing at all, even though artisanal fishery and, and, and fishing for, for, uh, for, for subsistence. I mean, this is completely wrong, you know? So all those things, and you need to actually facilitate in a situation of power asymmetry, which is getting bigger and bigger. I think the role of the government, of uh, local governments, of NGOs, perhaps also our role, could be our role, is to help facilitating this process. 
I mean, this is for me a normal. This is, this is the normal thing which we have in Switzerland as a political process. And I don't want to sh say that Switzerland is the best place. However, you also know that Switzerland has exactly those guys putting their money <laughs> from whom we want the money to be distributed. Perhaps we should have a referendum that this money should be confiscated by the Swiss government and redistributed all, all over. But um, I'm just uh, thinking aloud. No, but I do think it's actually really important to bring that Swiss example in as part of part of this case because there's a, there's a I mean as we know the SDGs are universal and they apply to Switzerland and the UK and the US as much as they do to, to Zambia or, or, or Vietnam <coughs> and actually to look at the role of those processes yep. and the fact that they do yeah. exist in, exactly. in some other countries. Um, so let's take another another round. So who else would like to come in at this time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just pick up on the point that uh, was made that the SDGs are general? Um, and I think it was SDG 9 that was reformulated on the large scale land acquisition. Mm -hmm. I know, I know what, what you mean. Yeah. 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 Should we take yep. Yep. So we we'll come to that point. Yep. Here. Uh, yep, that one, yep. Yeah, this slide, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I was just curious, so um, in, in terms of just like um, you know, property institutions mm -hmm. in theory, um, I mean, I, I understand that um, you know, people like um, Asimoglu um, state that property institutions are central, mm -hmm. and the rationale being that you know, um, stronger property institutions leads to reduced transaction costs, yep. exactly. leads to greater economic yep. growth. Yep. Um, Austria, I've seen mentioned a few times in the literature. I'm aware she won a, a Nobel Prize, yep. I think. Um, but she, what is so? It, it's about holding property in common. But um, what what does this is, is is economic growth not central to this analysis? And also, mm -hmm. um, the, the re transaction costs are they are they reduced by? I mean, in your final slide, you talked about um, almost like a like a double jeopardy. Yep. Is is that related to Austria? Yep. Yeah, it, it is. I come back to that point. Yeah, yeah. And not a blueprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From the others yeah. Exactly. Who don't share our viewpoints. Yeah. Uh, and that's one question. Or do we believe that there is no possibility of such a cooperation? From yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that's really, a very really very good, really good point. Very so good points. I think that last one also relates to how do you measure it? So yeah. Is this exactly. Great enthusiasm to have indicators. Of indicators and measuring and have figures, etc. So what do you measure? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah, measurement, good. Mm -hmm. um, with the first question, I'm still a bit struggling. Could you 
perhaps uh, reformulate it uh, again, because I, I'm not really sure whether I got it correctly. It's not your mistake. It's, uh, I'm a bit exhausted <laughs> at the moment. Yeah, talking. It's a big idea. I'll try to put it in short. Um, so for me, there seems to be a dilemma. Yeah, so the dilemma, OK. Mm -hmm. Party A could say, uh, from a point of utilitarism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we have to bring in big lives. Mm -hmm. OK, food, the, the food. Yeah. These, these points, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, on the first point, it's a huge dilemma um, because you have again, you look at the figures, you look how population is is growing, you have these calculations again. If in 10, 20, 30 years, you know, and you have these caricatures which are around with with the globe and uh, everybody sitting on each and everybody, and there's no food, etc. Um, and then you have the reality that you have exactly these companies, and I take again ADAX. ADAX won prices because they say, on top of it all, biofuel, we're going to produce more food for local people. And now, a couple of years later, there is nothing. I mean, this is what I'm astonished, you know. I mean, those... They, that they promise things. They say, we're going to feed the world. But we have evidence that this is just not true. They do the opposite. They undermine people being able to feed themselves. And I think there's a lot of literature that can show this. And the problem of hunger is not, I mean, uh, and there we, I didn't put, put this uh, there, the, the discussion of one, two, three, four, and five. Um, uh, the old work of, of Arturo Escobar and others uh, bring us back to this idea. I mean, of course, what's hunger, the whole discussion of what's hunger. But if you look, if I see in Zambia uh, the time when we started doing research, um, there was a hunger crisis. But why was there a hunger crisis? Not because there were too many people. It was because, first, people didn't have access to fish because the other ones were getting the fish. Second, uh, crops were failing because of drought, yes, okay, but because the subvention scheme that the government paid for seed and fertilizer and everything was collapsing because they didn't get the money from copper, so they didn't have subsidies, so everything was going down the drain. In a community of more than a thousand households, we found only three households who still had old maize varieties who could actually produce from scratch, and they were doing quite well without the inputs. We also had another field where we used um, the, 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 the new seeds without inputs Nothing. Complete failure. So, I mean, it's it really, I mean, they, they speak about something, all these big companies, where they can't stand the test. But there's another, uh, another twist to this. Um, what the companies do in certain areas, we have a research also in Kenya, that um, people are pushed to marginal areas where they get dependent from companies. So in Genta, etc., they sell small portions of, you know, um, seed and fertilizer and everything. And, and, and it's clear, so my student counted in, in, um, in Lake Kipia, in the, in the north of Kenya, actually farmers relay on 47 products, international products coming in, you know. I mean, amazing. And of course they can't do without, but it is those small farmers who produce most, and it's not the big, the big schemes. The big schemes, they, they, of course, they are important. I mean, it's the whole picture. But if we would only rely on the big, big farms, <laughs> I mean, 90%, I'm, I'm perhaps polemic again, but 90% of, of people living in the so-called uh, uh, global south would starve to death from today on, if we would only rely on those promises. And I think, this is, I, I don't know, this is something that has not been discussed. They're making promises which they can't keep. And there's a failure. We started with so many cases of large-scale land acquisition, with promises, jobs, more production, etc. And 80% or 90% of the cases where we started, and it's about 10 or more, they're no longer there. In Kenya, Dominion Farms, an investor from, from, um, um, from the US who got his money from, uh, um, he set up prisons, high security prisons, Dominion. That, that's how he got the money, you know. So he invested this in Kenya. He's a very religious guy. He says, I bring Jesus to Kenya. Jesus brings food. So they produce rice. And now the whole production 
after uh, a couple of years is now going down. They're no longer producing due to several things. So th there's no rice produced there. If we just rely on those people, <laughs> we all go, go hungry. That's, that's the, this is the point which I'm, which I'm making. And perhaps w very quickly to, um, again, we have the issue of the blueprint. Yes, of course, there's a big danger. This is why it is an experiment. But let us have it as an experiment and let us have it also uh, in a way that we say, this is our version of it. I don't want the uh, UN to say, well, uh, Tobias and colleagues, perfect. We change that and put that in. What we would like to do is we would like to have a greater discussion process, scientific and local discussion process. That needs to be debated. It's not that I'm saying, well, this is now, this is now the Bible. This is the political ecology, new institutionalism Bible. And please pray on this one. I will be the last one to actually uh, ask this. Uh, if th that happened, then I will feel very, very, very uneasy about this. So perhaps uh, th this is the important point. And then um, there's this issue regarding the, um, also the, the, the measurement, right? Who? No, it was the, uh, the, the Ostrom. Oh, sorry, the Ostrom, so excuse me. Uh, excuse me, the, 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 the Ostrom point. Um, there, um, I mean, Williamson and Ostrom got both the Nobel Prize for um, economy or, or economics <clears throat> for their work on institutions. And I think what, with, with Ostrom, what is interesting is that she shows, well, it is possible to manage in a sustainable way um, actually a collective, uh, a collective good. And that is possible because it also reduces transaction costs. If people know who is in and out, if they are monitoring and sanctioning rules, um, then things are running with less transaction costs. But what she missed, and this is the big critique, she did not include who is deciding on these rules. And what happens that these systems are no longer working. And what I'm advocating is regarding, if, we ha regard, uh, if you look at uh, social sustainability, and these are also transaction costs which you have there, which feed into environmental issues, then we need to go back somehow to that type of system because there are checks and balances. It does not outrule private property. Many of the common property systems were not just only common property, they also have private property things. This is a fascinating old work by Robert Netting, again, sorry, Switzerland, uh, uh, village in, in, in the valley, Turbo. Um, who shows this, you know? You can only have as much cattle as you can feed on your own meadows where you produce hay for the winter. And not, you can only lead that number of cattle up to the alpine pasture. So there's a check and balance, an interrelation between private property and common property. The whole discussion is, is, not, is not related to this, although we have all these data. It's there, but it's not picked up. Good, well, we're nearly out of time, but if there are any final burning questions, I see some people shooting their hands up. Did you want to come in? Yeah. Uh, I feel like you're not talking much about national government. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's a problem. Yep. No, it is a problem. Is top, it's a top-down approach. And that's my first comment. Second comment, talking about Africa, it seems that you're very accepting of what's happening there at the moment. The chiefs, you know, the power relationships. Yet, let's be honest, it's mm -hmm. some things that are happening there. It's just horrible. It is, yeah. And I understand from my European perspective, what do I know? Why should I judge? Yet somehow accepting what's happening there at the moment is mm -hmm. not the right way no. of approaching things. No. Perhaps if you think that I'm accepting, I think the, the, perhaps this is a misunderstanding. I do not accept. I want to know how it came about. I want to know why are there now chiefs in Zambia, for instance, where I did my field work, who actually uh, say of themselves, we are legitimate, we are traditional, and then I look at the history and see that, that they're not, and then I'm observing these processes. And this is why me not saying it is okay, this is why in the fishery project, my wife and I, we said, okay, let's get the input of all the other people to challenge the chief. But it's difficult, he's a political reality, if you have him completely out, then you also are in trouble, you know? I mean, that, that's, that, that's the point. I mean, it can be a discussion, it can be, I mean, chiefs can be pushed, pushed away, you know? But it's, I think, um, it's not accepting, it's balancing the power of these people so that their power is sort of where they cannot create too much harm. And regarding state, this is a very, very important aspect. I'm 
very, um, I think your critique is very, very well taken. We criticize that it's only a state perspective, but actually we should also have an anthropology of the state view. How is the state working? I mean, uh, James Scott seeing like a state. We need to understand how the state is working, what is difficult with the state, and what, where the state is absolutely also needed. Also, local people in the fisheries, they say, we want the fishery department people to come and to assist us. We want the health uh, department come and to help us. But we also want to say what our problems are, and we want, don't want to be treated like small kids, you know? I mean, and, and this is something, again, which we have in Switzerland. We have this, I mean, I'm glad that the state is there, all those are, are, I criticize the state, but the state gives me the political umbrella that guarantees my, my rights but gives me the liberty to develop my, my own things. And I think that is, that is really crucial, and I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's too little in there, and we have to think about it. Yeah, I'm thanks. I'm going to let James come in if it's also partly a wrapping up kind of question or comment. Thank you. <laughs> oh, fascinating presentation. Yeah. I've been okay. thinking why it is that I find it very useful. Yeah. And uh, the first is that it's, it's a very interesting vehicle by using mm -hmm. the literature mm -hmm. to reformulate mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Completely. Uh, yes, they were a participatory process, but they didn't embrace the, the critical literature as part of that participation. Absolutely. Yeah. And then third, I, I suppose it shows the biases um, in the participatory processes that were part of the formulation of yeah. the SDG, uh, in the sense that uh, many of the critical issues got written out. Yeah. Uh, then I, I suppose what... Um, it's a way of uh, reformulating done through the literature of anthropology. I wonder what it would be like if you reformulated it through the literature of uh, different disciplines. Of course, yeah. of course. And, and yeah. maybe that would be a productive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. alternative to saying mm -hmm. you've been hesitant to do this to, for, for OECD to take this on. Well, that's good because it's just one discipline among many. Exactly. But there are many other ways in which of course. these reformulations of course. might be Exactly. Um, uh, to render the SDGs, to transform them from yep. um, from these kinds of principles mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. blueprints, but mm -hmm. that might be exactly. radical reformulation of yep. the sort that we have yep. to, to put together. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Those comments. Well, that's, good. That's Very a good. Fantastic and fantastic set of summing up comments. So I'm not going to add any more to that, except Great. really to ask. I will thank take you. those notes. <laughs> Thanks no, a lot. Really to thank you, and I mean this no, fits um, into quite a lot of other question we've, we've been doing about reformulating. Yeah, 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 I mean, we had yeah. a great Sussex Development Lecture, which was about reformulating from the perspectives of people living mm -hmm, in extreme mm -hmm. poverty and yeah, marginalization. Yeah. And there what came through were some similar arguments to those that you've made about bottom-up places is, but also the fact that you can't deal with each of the SDGs alone. No, actually, no, they, they are into... Exactly, into exactly, exactly. So, exactly. Um, I think this has been a really useful session. Um, I'd encourage people to, to have a look at the at the the wider pamphlet there and, and actually to look up some of this literature because it certainly brings some really important angles to environment and development debates yeah. along with other literatures. And, so um, perhaps very quickly, it can be downloaded yeah, from yeah. our web 